All right, hi everyone. Welcome back to another session of 8X Pixel 360 Virtual Expo and wishing all our viewers a very happy wildlife day. So for today's session on animal behavior, we're joined by underwater photographer and author of this very book in my hand, The Lives of Gobies by Dr. Klaus Stiefel. In conjunction with World Wildlife Day, Dr. Klaus will be sharing with us the fascinating and minute world of gobies. So now before we begin this exciting session, let me introduce our guest. So originally from Vienna, Austria, Dr. Klaus is a biologist teaching at the Silliman University Institute for Environmental and Marine Scientists in the Philippines. Dr. Klaus is also an underwater photographer and videographer, a popular science writer, and a technical diving instructor. So his latest book, The Lives of Gobies, is out now, published by Asian Geographic Magazine's Private Limited. In fact, this very book in my hand right now is filled with such amazing pictures and very informative text. So for all our viewers, if you purchase this book today, you guys will receive a free copy of Asia's Most Extreme, the latest issue of Asian Geographic, which I also have with me. Uh, note that this deal is only for today, the 3rd of March, 2022, in conjunction with World Wildlife Day. So now I'll pass it over to Dr. Klaus to begin his wonderful session. So the floor is yours, Dr. Klaus. Thank you. Thank you so much for the nice introduction. I really appreciate it. <laughs> so um, may I get the first screen, please, the first uh, slide. So the lives of Gobies. Um, so this book just uh, went to print uh, this week. I'm really excited about this. Uh, I actually haven't had a, a copy in my hand yet. So th this is going to be even more exciting. And I will tell you a little bit more about the book, but first I will tell you more about Gobi so that you're as enthusiastic about Gobi as I am. So let's start with a few facts. Gobies are among the smallest vertebrates and the smallest fishes. They are Gobies which are less than seven millimeters adult size. And these, that means their brains are less than a cubic millimeter in uh, volume. Now, in English, of course, it's an insult to call somebody a bird brain, and bird brains are, are much bigger than goby brains. And but nevertheless, uh, nobody gets called a goby brain yet. But both insults would be incorrect from the point of view of a zoologist, because even though their brain volume is very small, they're still uh, extremely smart little fishes. And I will walk you through three goby behaviors. One which you might possibly know as a scuba diver, you might have observed this already, and two which I would think, unless you are, you're really well read into the Gobi literature, you are, you're not uh, familiar with yet. So can I get the next slide, please? This is a Gobi of the uh, genus Eviota, and this is to make the point how small this fish are. So this fish is perching on a soft coral. And if you're scuba divers, I'm sure you have seen similar soft corals many times. The, these polyps, these flower-shaped structures in the background, they're probably about a millimeter and a half in diameter. So, the, you know, this is very hard to make out with your, uh, you know, naked eye. But this fish, you know, makes them look like gigantic flowers. So. Uh, there, there are very few vertebrate animals on the planet which are larger. Now, uh, can I get the next, which, which are smaller? The, the next slide, thank you. So this is the first behavior I would like to introduce you to. Now, you can obviously, you can see this fish here, this goby, and this is uh, Ambu Eleotris Steinitzi, and it's paired with, on the left side, with a alpha H ring. Now, what's an alpha shrimp? It's a shrimp which has uh, two claws, where one is uh, much bigger, so it's asymmetric. And these two animals live in what is called a mutualistic symbiosis. So none of them is able to make it through life on its own. What they're doing is they're sharing a burrow and they're sharing this burrow in the sandy areas next to coral reefs. And if there was a, a predatory fish which would be approaching, they would both hide in that burrow. Now, who digs the burrow? It is the, the shrimp. 
So you can see the shrimp working here. The shrimp has the, these powerful jaws and they're very industrious. They're constantly working on building these burrows. Now, you can also see that it took this, uh, this structure here, this plate, which I believe might be a, uh, you know, a, a coral skeleton, part of a destroyed coral. And then there's this round structure, which is a sea urchin uh, test, so a bit like a shell of a dead sea urchin. Now, not only are they very industrious, um, but again, even though they have very small brains, they're actually quite clever engineers. And the shrimp, however, if you look at the eyes of the shrimp here, you can barely see the eyes because they're very small. So the eyesight of the shrimp is not very good. Now, the, the uh, goby, in contrast, actually has rather large eyes for such a small fish. And this enables the goby to uh, be on the lookout for predatory animals. Now, uh, then shoot this predatory fish you know, in, in the sandy area approach the pair. Can I get the next slide, please? There, this is, uh, can I get to the next um, image? So then, yeah, thank you very much. This is another example where there's actually a pair of gobies. And um, these are on the lookout for these predators. Should a predator come very close, they would just turn around and very quickly uh, escape into the shared world. Now, at that point, the shrimp knows that it's not safe on the outside and that it has to stay on the inside. How does the shrimp know that? Well, if you look at this image, if the shrimp has this, its antenna in constant contact with the fins or the body of the goby. And most of the time, it's actually the dorsal fin or the um, caudal fin of the goby. Now, if there is a predator which is still further away, and we're probably talking about a meter here, the goby will still see that fish, but, and it, it will give the, uh, the shrimp a signal. And the, the signal would be something like a very fast tail flick. So these uh, dorsal or caudal fin, so the tail fin or the fin at the back of the fish, they would very quickly oscillate, you know, uh, flick uh, to the left and to the right, and the shrimp would see this. So what we have here is we have a tactile communication system between uh, a uh, crustacean and a fish. So this is probably similar if you are a wreck diver and uh, all of a sudden there's a silt out and you have to communicate with your dive buddy. You might touch the dive buddy and pull his or her fingers, you know, her, th her thumb to one side or the other. So, so they're communicating by a very sophisticated system of touches where these, these uh, tail flicks communicate to the other animal what is going on. So while a full escape of the goby into the burrow is something like a red alert. A tail flick is something like an orange alert. So that, you know, the predator is still a while away, but there might be something to worry about, dear shrimp. And, you know, please stay in the burrow. So we have this mutualistic symbiosis where the shrimp is digging and the goby is acting as a watchman. And they have uh, evolved this, this really sophisticated communication system. I've actually, one of my last uh, research publication was a computer model of what's happening in the brains of these goals. And it's probably a, a structure in the hindbrain, which changed here. Uh, cells in the vicinity of the escape reflex cells of this fish. Can I get the next um, slide, please? So this, is uh, another species of um, Eleotris here. Could I get to the next? Yeah, thank you very much. And um, this is a, a goby of the species Cryptocentus cinctus. And you can again see that the right antenna of this shrimp is, uh, you know, uh, angled to the right, and the shrimp will not spend a second outside of the burrow without being in physical contact with the goby. So even though these are very different animals, of course, a crustacean and a fish, 
they, they have managed to essentially develop a type of touch language. I mean, of course, it's a language which with only a few words, and the words would be, you know, danger and great danger. But nevertheless, uh, I think this, this type of communication really is another indication that fish are not stupid. Um, I think this is, you know, from so many years of diving, this is really uh, every diver do I see impressive behavior by fish. Um, get, can I get the next slide, please? So, so much for the communication of uh, bovis now, uh, with shrimp. Now, the, this is a behavior which is, has probably, um, is probably not as widely known. And this is the, the flexing of the dorsal fin. So this is a Randall shrimp goby, which is named after the fish biology and underwater photography pioneer, uh, Jack Randall, who I think passed away four years ago at, uh, in his 90s. And um, so look at the, the dorsal fin of this fish. There is this big target, you know, this big mark. And why do these uh, fish have that? So uh, if we could get go to the next slide, please, and play the video. So I filmed this uh, Randall shrimp goby uh, in the Philippines on the wonderful island of Sikihua, which is also known for its black magic. And you, you can see that the, this Randall shrimp goby, which has a slightly different, actually it has these two target spots on its dorsal fin. This shrimp goby is constantly flexing, you know, retracting and re-erecting it's dorsal fin. Now, um, this is a communication signal between two different gobies. So uh, if you know where to look, a lot of these gobies and shrimp gobies are actually very abundant. So uh, th there might only be 30, 40 centimeters between this fish and the next fish. And what are the telling with this, uh, you know, fin flexing, what are they telling the next fish? Well, um, that the next uh, image uh, will explain this. The same thing as this peacock does. And actually the mark, so this image is from Wikipedia, that's the only image here, which I didn't take. These markings on the tail feathers of the male peacock, say the same thing as these target-like markings on the dorsal fin of this goby, which is, I'm here, I'm big, I own this place. You know, this is my territory, go away. Uh, I'm the king here. So, so this, it's showing off. And it, of course, the eyes of a peacock and of a goby will, will work very differently. But these, these very salient signals, you know, there's this, uh, uh, these spots, you know, these target spots, they, they're eye-catching to anybody, no matter whether you are a human, a bird, or a goby. So, so this type of communication uh, between gobies is essentially, it's the same as a gorilla, a male gorilla beating uh, his chest. This is, this is to show off, and hence, you know, these large fins on a very small fish. So that, that was the second behavior. Very interesting. The small fish, but have a big ego. And can I get the next slide, please? Now, this is a really interesting behavior, which is called gobi bobbing. And this, uh, maybe some of you have seen that, but this is actually not widely known. And there's one, I, I found one scientific study by a Japanese group, I believe from the 1980s. And so this is a gobi of the genus Cryptocent, um, uh, Stenogobio um, aureus, and I uh, photographed this in the northern Philippines in Bolinao. And again, these were very abundant. So these also live together with shrimps, and there is probably one at least per square meter in this, you know, shallow rubber area. So these see each other. If when they're perching outside of the burrows, they will have a visual contact to the next uh, goby. Now, what would they be talking about? Um, 
Can I get the next slide, please? So they would be talking about dangers. Now, this fish is about, this is a lizard fish, probably again, if you're divers, you've seen this many times. Maybe you have not seen such a close-up. If you are a goby, and if you see these teeth, this might be the last thing you ever see. If, if you are a goby, you might want to warn other gobies in the environment. So the way they do this is by this odd type of bobbing movement. So they're jumping up and down a bit. We can see that on the next slide when we look at the video, please. And then, so this is, um, I'm bored now, if we just, we can fast forward. I think that it's already doing it. Yeah, see, this is this jumping movement, which we get here. Now, now they're, they're pushing themselves off the sand with their pelvic fins. And, uh, you know, this this jumping movement here, this says, careful, there's a predator around here. In, in contrast to the first behavior, which we discussed, this tail flick, this is not communication between goby and shrimp. This is communication between goby and goby. Interestingly, this can be passed on so one goby would see a lizard fish, it would start bobbing, and the second goby, even though it's not seeing any lizard fish or any predator, would also uh, continue bobbing. So essentially, they're passing on this message, even though the second or third goby would not even be uh, you know, visually detecting a predator, but they're still uh, they are, they're spreading the word about a nearby predator by starting to jump like this when they see another goby jump. So yeah, this is this is uh, there's very little scientific literature on this. I think there's there's one scientific paper on this. If you're careful on your next dive, maybe you will have the chance to see this. Who do you think these? Uh, yeah, thank you. Can we go to the next slide, please? Who do you think the predatory uh, animal was, which the goby saw during that uh, episode? It was probably me. You know, they probably saw me approach, and they were swimming very carefully, and they uh, decided that it's worth. Um, you know, telling their neighbors that there's something suspicious, a diver in the vicinity. Now, th this is another uh, species where I had observed this goby. This is a, a goby of the uh, genus Cryptocentos. Uh, this image also explains why I'm, you know, one of the reasons why I'm so fascinated by gobies, which is because they're extremely beautiful. So if you have a good camera and take these close-up shots, I mean, you get this. It This looks like it, it was designed in the 1960s. Um, so these, um, this fish I photographed in Darwin in the Philippines, uh, you can see the black volcanic sand, which is very uh, typical for our area. Now, uh, this uh, species also communicates with others. So there's a little quiz you can try to answer for yourself. I will give the solution at the end of the presentation. There's something wrong with this goby. Uh, if, if you look very closely at this image, uh, maybe you, you will be able to see what the problem of this goby. I, uh, you know, uh, I'll give you a few more seconds. You know, what, what is the health problem, particularly of this goby? Ah, uh, anybody? I'll, I'll give you the solution in a short while. Now, uh, can I get the next slide, please? So these are three behaviors of um, of these gobies, and there's so much more to talk about both in terms of behavior, in terms of evolution, in terms of biodiversity. And this is covered in my book. And the, I'm, I'm saying my book, but I should really say our book. Uh, so I'm listed as the author, but there are um, a number of people who have or also played a big role in uh, making this uh, possible. Of course, John Ted and team, and Franz and Victor at Asian Geographic did a great job. I love the layout. 
And, uh, you know, this, this was a very smooth process. It was also Marty Snyderman donated some photographs about Caribbean gobies, where I don't have so much material. My fiancé, Gleis Avril, did the proofreading. So get the book. I think um, even if I wasn't the author, I would recommend that. And uh, one more slide, please. Uh, so this is the solution. This is the solution to the quiz. I wonder if uh, any of you saw it. So this is a close-up of this goby. And if you look at the base of this pectoral fin, of the, I'm sorry, of this pelvic fin, there is a major parasite sitting there. So this is some kind of isoport. And this, it's very unfortunate if, exactly, it's very unfortunate if you have essentially a gigantic uh, tick on, on your body and you have no hands to scratch or to pull it off. And uh, there's actually a lot of marine fish are really affected by such parasites. And uh, this goby, it's unclear um, what's going to happen with it. It's probably not going to kill it, but likely it will reduce its life expectancy or its, its health and reproductive output. So I hope you enjoyed this. Again, you know, I hope you, you'll get our book. Um, if you like to see more of my photographs, there's a lot on social media. All right, yay. Thank you so much, Dr. Klaus, for joining us today and the wonderful presentation for us. For all our viewers, you can check out his latest book, which is The Lives of Gobies, written by our lovely guest, Dr. Klaus, and published by Asian Geographic Magazine's Private Limited. Uh, get your hands on this really informative book by going to www.asiangeo.com shop and purchase your copy now. So for all our viewers, if you purchase this book today, that is the 3rd of March, you will receive a free copy of Asia's Most Extreme, the latest issue of Asia's Asian Geographic. And for our audiences, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them below and we'll try our best to answer them. Uh, stay tuned for our next session happening shortly, which is in conversation with David Strike and Paul Strike. Uh, thank you so much once again, Dr. Klaus, for joining us today and see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.